Welcome to Richter's Videos. We're pleased to present this short video to help you discover a whole new world of herbs and veggies at Richter's. Artemisias, the herb of the year for 2014. Artemisias are a large and diverse group of plants. Over 400 species are known to man. From those species, breeders have developed dozens upon dozens of improved cultivars and introduced them to horticulture. The Herb of the Year program is a project of the International Herb Association. Since 1995, they have honored one herb each year for its culinary or medicinal or decorative properties. It has been a great program over the years for raising the awareness of herbs and how they can improve our lives. Well, where does Artemisia come from? Well, the name comes from the Greek goddess Artemis, the goddess of the wilderness and of the hunt. In the Roman pantheon, she's known as Diana. And she was one tough customer. She was... Uh, she lived in the woods and she was very protective of the woman folk who lived with her. Uh, if any man wished to have his way with any of the women, she wasn't afraid to pull out one of those arrows and shoot him through the heart. But she was also a great heal healer and she understood the importance and power of the plants of the woods. She passed on the knowledge of, of, of the healing plants to Chiron, the centaur who was a great healer, astrologer, and an oracle. He was the one who developed the first medicines from Artemisia and made them available to Greek society. Well, if you ask a gardener what Artemisias are good for, he or she will probably tell you about the Artemisias as landscape plants with their silver and gray foliage and their wonderful textures. Here you see a young garden, a new garden, that's just been planted with a lot of different types of artemisias. Low ones, tall ones, and in one year or so, it will fill in and provide a, a beautiful show. Well, artemisias aren't usually thought of as plants for food. In fact, as a group, they tend to have bitter principles. Most of them have bitter principles. Some of them are so bitter that they couldn't possibly be used for food. So the average gardener wouldn't ever think of artemisias as being used for food. But as it turns out, one of the culinary stars in the herb world, French tarragon, is an artemisia. Artemisia draconculus sativa. Of course, French tarragon with its sweet anise flavor and its licorice, uh, licorice flavor is critically important in French cuisine. Used for omelettes, marinated meat, poultry, and in here you can see in the upper left a sauce hollandaise on roasted uh, uh, asparagus, and in the bottom left sauce bayonnaise. On the right you see vinaigrette. Uh, the most, one of the most popular uses of fresh French tarragon. Fresh French tarragon is steeped in vinegar along with garlic and spices and of course uh, it makes a wonderful uh, salad dressing used for many many purposes in French cuisine. Well French tarragon turns out to be quite the exception. Not only is it not gray and not silver but it's not bitter. And in addition, it doesn't produce any seeds. It was, it is in fact a mutant plant. It was a plant that must have been found many years ago by, perhaps I imagine, a German, a prehistoric German who happened to be walking around and found this mutant plant growing among the wild tarragon in the fields in Europe. And notice how wonderful the flavor and this, uh, the fragrance was and probably had to dig it up and bring it home to his or her garden. This is the wild progenitor of tarragon. This tarragon is, is the same species, Artemisia draconculus, and it grows throughout 
Eurasia, from Eastern Europe all the way to Siberia. It also grows in North America through the West, uh, Western states and provinces uh, of North America. Unlike the French tarragon, wild tarragon produces seeds. And therein lies the reason why you find wild tarragon growing across most of the northern hemisphere. Well, as I mentioned, French tarragon is actually a mutant. It uh, polyploid, actually a tetraploid. Wild tarragon uh, has two sets of chromosomes. And the French tarragon, however, has doubled the number of chromosomes. This is called polyploidy, and it is very common in the plant kingdom. It does happen in, animal, in the animal kingdom as well, but it's quite rare. Uh, but in, uh, plants are well known for their uh, proclivity of creating mut mutant plants through polyploidy, or the doubling or multiplicity of, of chromosomes. In the case of French tarragon, what must have happened with that mutant plant, the first mutant plant, was that as the cells were trying to divide, first uh, the chromosomes divided, and then something interfered with the, the cell division process, and it didn't complete. And so you were left with cells that had doubled the number of chromosomes, and then they went on to divide. And so we say that it has 4N chromosomes. In the bottom panel of this slide you see bean leaves and you can, it's, as it turns out, you can induce polyploidy artificially using a compound from another herb, the autumn crocus. The compound colchicine has been used for more than a century by, by botanists and breeders to develop uh, mutant plants and new horticultural forms. On the bottom left, you see a normal bean leaf, and the other three panels are varying uh, effects of colchicine causing polyploidy and dramatic morphological changes. Well, if a plant can produce such dramatic morphological changes uh, that you can see, well, for sure, it can also change the chemistry, and that is what happened with the French tarragon. The wild tarragon is, tends to be bitter and has, oh, just an oh-so-small uh, hint of that uh, anise uh, licorice type of flavor. But the French tarragon, of course, uh, has had its chemistry completely rearranged, and now it very pronounced anise licorice flavor and a almost total absence of the bitter pr principles that are found in the wild tarragon. It turns out that another tarragon that's in commerce and is available in seed catalogs, including the Richter's catalog, is Russian tarragon. Russian tarragon is also a mutant. It has 10 sets of chromosomes. Here's a slide of the Russian tarragon, again the same species, Artemisia draconculus, but a different form. It will, this is a younger, young uh, plant that is still in its low phase, low growing phase. It will grow up, shoot up, create flowers, and produce lots of seeds. Russian tarragon has very little flavor and aroma. It's not bitter like the wild tarragon, it is used in medicine, but for many years it was foisted upon an unsuspecting public as the real tarragon by uh, greenhouse operators and, uh, and, and the horticultural industry. You see, growing tarragon from seed uh, is so much easier than growing tarragon from cuttings or division as you must do for the French tarragon since it doesn't produce seeds. So, this went on for quite a few years, especially when we first started in the, in the herb business. We, we saw French ter uh, Russian tarragon all over uh, being offered for sale instead of the real tarragon. We still carry it in our catalogs. A main reason for that is to show how different it is uh, and to make the point how different it is from the real French tarragon. 
but we don't recommend it. Another important culinary herb among the Artemisias is mugwort. European mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris. It is a slightly bitter herb that is traditionally used with rich meats like game, duck, goose. Meats that are rich in fats and are therefore hard to digest. That's, that bitter principle stimulates the digestive system. It starts the flow of gastric juices and bile from the gallbladder. And those together help to process and digest the foods, the rich food. And, and in so doing, it prevents indigestion. The mugworts are very hardy. They grow tall, up to three to five feet. They can spread as they spread by seeds, but they're not invasive, or at least they're very easy to control. They're not particularly attractive as horticultural plants, but there are forms like this one that potentially could be developed into horticultural forms. This has a bit more of a reddish cast to the, to the flowers, and in the hands of a breeder, it may be developed into a dried flower uh, or a fresh cut flower. And it makes fantastic dishes. This one here is venison marinated with mugwort along with wild garlic and blue potato. Wow, this is just so nice looking. I wish I could just grab it and eat it. Well, it turns out that the, the mugworts are not just a single plant, but in fact a group of plants. And the Japanese have their own form, called yomogi, or Japanese mugwort, Artemisia princeps. It has much more deeply cut leaves, and it too, like the European mugwort, has a bit of a bitter, a bitter taste to it. But it's not overwhelmingly bitter, and it is quite pleasant. The Japanese make a wonderful uh, dumpling called yomogi dumplings made with gelatinous rice and the fresh or dried young leaves of the yomogi. The slightly bitter taste is essential to the taste of the yomogi dumplings. As already mentioned, on the whole the Artemisias are bitter herbs and it is that bitter quality that led to their being used to make various alcoholic beverages. As far back as 3,500 years ago, and probably much earlier, Artemisia was used to make medicinal drinks. And those drinks include some of our most iconic aperitifs still in common use today. Vermouth you can't make a martini or a Manhattan without it. Vermouth is French for the word wormwood, the Artemisia used to make the drink. The wormwood plant is steeped in wine along with sugar and other bitter herbs. Absinthe is another classic drink made with wormwood. The leaves and flowers along with anise, fennel and other herbs are made are used to make the distilled drink. In the 1800s it developed a reputation as a dangerous drink. Van Gogh was thought to have gone crazy from drinking absinthe and by 1915 absinthe was banned in Europe and America. The culprit was presumed to be thujone a compound found in wormwood. Thurjone is known to be psychoactive if you take too much. But by the 1990s, the bands were removed because thurjone is present only at very low levels in absinthe and is not dangerous at all. The thing about absinthe is that it is a very strong drink, very high in alcohol, upwards of 70%. And it is not supposed to be taken straight. It is usually diluted with water. But, of course, some people did take it straight. And that, more than anything, probably led to its reputation as a dangerous drink. This is a source of the Artemisia used to make absinthe. It's common wormwood 
or Artemisia absinthium. Clearly, the name absinthe comes from the Latin name. It's a tall, hardy, easy-to-grow plant with a grayish cast. Today, this is the preferred source for, uh, for absinthe and for vermouth, the Roman wormwood, Artemisia pontica. It has a lower thujone content. It is also lower growing, and it is hardy, very hardy. But it isn't grown from seeds like the common wormwood. This one has to be grown by division or by cuttings. Herbal bitters like these are popular in Europe, especially after a heavy meal. A shot of bitters made with artemisia and other herbs helps get the digestive process going and helps to prevent indigestion. And of course, and of course if your stomach feels less full at night, you get a better night's sleep. And there are other drinks that are made, alcoholic drinks that are made with artemisias. Ginepi, shown here, is made in southern Europe with black wormwood, Artemisia ginepi. It is a little higher in thujone than the other Artemisia-based drinks. And chartreuse is also made with black wormwood and many other herbs. Chartreuse is made by the Carthusian monks in the Chartreuse Mountains of France. Of course, it's another iconic drink. Just as the Artemisias are, on the whole, bitter herbs, they are also, on the whole, aromatic. Their leaves possess essential oils, which are volatile and will escape to the air when you brush against the foliage. Many of the aromatic Artemisias are quite pungent. But as we have seen with tarragon, the artemisias have a capacity to develop pleasing aromatic forms. This is southern wood, Artemisia abrotanum, a hardy perennial with a wonderful floral citrusy fragrance. It grows quite tall, up to three to five feet tall, but in this slide you see it clipped into a nice globular shape. There are, several, there are several forms of southern wood, including this one, camphor southern wood. It has a hint of camphor, which is quite pleasant, and it is lower growing, only up to two to three feet in height. An important aromatic use of the Artemisias is for ritual use by the Native Americans. They would burn dried bundles of Artemisia like this one for purification purposes. It was called a process called smudging. This is one of the Artemisias used to make smudging sticks, the iconic sagebrush of the American West. It is also called desert sage. It is known to possess antibacterial oils, which likely explains why smudging was associated with purification rituals. The Native Americans would smudge an area before important meetings, and the antiseptic oils probably were dispersed to the air with the smoke. That Those antiseptic oils would help stop the spread of diseases. After all, diseases had a devastating effect on Native Americans and smudging may have been one of the ways to stop the transmission of diseases. This is another Artemisia used for smudging, the prairie wormwood. Where, where this plant was abundant, it would have been used by the Native Americans to make the smudge sticks. There's a lot of confusion about the actual herb used for smudging. The herb used was always referred to as white sage. In California, there is indeed a true sage, Salvia apiana, which is called white sage, and is used for smudging. But it doesn't grow in northern areas, and it is not hardy enough. 
So what sage did the Native Americans use in the northern states and in Canada for smudging? Well, it turns out that different plants are used in different areas and by different tribes. As you can stick at the top, you can see has wider leaves. These are the leaves of the true white sage from California pictured beside it. The bundle below, the smudge stick below, has leaves that are much more narrow and those are characteristic of the sagebrush or the prairie wormwood. So whichever type of white sage that was used for smudging depended on the location of the tribe. If the Greek legends are to be believed at all, they tell that Artemisia became the first medicine when Artemis taught Chiron the centaur about its powers as a healing herb. But you know, you can make a plausible argument that Artemisia was indeed the first medicine used by man. The Artemisias are known to improve digestion by stimulating the digestive system. That much we've talked about already. But as the name Wormwood suggests, the Artemisias also improve digestive health by expelling or killing worms in the gut. Now why would that be so important? Well, to the early hunters and gatherers, that must have been really important because they depended on wild meat. And of course, in those days there was no government meat inspection system, so it is safe to assume that early man had to contend with worms and other parasites from eating that wild meat. And this is one of the worms that they had to have contended with, the beef tapeworm. This disgusting thing can get 12 meters long, 40, 40 feet. Imagine that in your gut. Well, this is the common wormwood we talked about before. It is one of the artemisias used to make vermouth in absinthe. It is a powerful vermifuge, that is an agent that expels or kills intestinal worms. But there are other, other artemisias as well that do much the same thing. And these artemisias would have been a huge, huge revelation to those early hunters and gatherers. This one, Santonica, is, is one of the Santonicas that contains a compound called Santonin. And that compound is known to expel worms. And there are several types of Santonica. And this one, the Levant worm seed, or Artemisia cena, is the main one that was used since ancient times. The unopened flower heads are considered one of the safest vermifuges, even safe for children. And it was an important article of trade going back to Mesopotamia. Uh, it was brought to Europe by the Crusades because it was so important and improved health uh, by, by uh, getting rid of worms. And this is another species from Turkestan, Russia, and Kazakhstan. It's also a source of santonin. This one was used for roundworms and threadworms. Well, while the ancients, ancients were preoccupied by digestive problems, the modern medical star among the Artemisias is this plant, the sweet annie, or sweet wormwood also known in botanically as Artemisia annua. It's a native of Eastern Europe and Asia and has been cultivated in China for at least 2,000 years. It is highly aromatic and for many years was known in the West as a source of dried floral branches for the floral industry and for making wonderful aromatic reeds. But in the 1980s, the U.S. Army put out a call for seeds because it was interested in this plant's anti-malarial properties. 
The plant contains artemisinin and two other chemical derivatives of it that have been shown to be effective against chloroquine resistant malaria. This plant has gone on to become one of our most important anti-malarial uh, medicines and in some areas of the world it is our last line of defense against the disease where malaria with a malaria parasite has become resistant to all other drugs. It turns out that there are other artemisias that have been used for uh, for malaria like symptoms uh, fever this one here African wormwood from southern southern Africa has been long used for fever and malaria so it turns out that the anti-malarial compounds are found in different species in the Artemisia Well, coming back to Yumogi, the Japanese mugwort we talked about earlier. Uh, besides its use to make the Yumogi dumplings, it is also a medicinal. It is used to make moxa. Those are plugs or sticks of pressed dried mugwort leaves that are burned the burning cones and sticks are placed on the acupuncture points in order to stimulate the flow of chi, much like needles do in acupuncture. Sometimes the moxa is pierced with a needle and then the needle is, is stuck in the acupuncture points. And the odor, the smoke, and the essential oils that are released by the burning process contribute to the medicinal effect. Uh, this, po this whole method is called moxibustion and, and practitioners believe that moxibustion is effective for the treatment of chronic problems. Um, what's characterized in, in oriental medicine as deficient conditions or weakness. And it is especially useful for, uh, for the elderly. Well, we talked about the culinary, aromatic, beverage, and medicinal significance of the Artemisias, but they are best known for their use in the garden. The Artemisias are hardy, tolerant of drought, and are unbothered by pests. They come in silvers and grays, of different textures, and of different growing heights. So they offer a lot of flexibility for use in the landscape. You can paint a bold swath of silver or gray through the garden, along a path, or as a low border in front of a garden, or as a high border at back. I love how the Artemisias undulate like a wave in front of the purple Russian sage and the yellow yarrow in this garden. There are many varieties or improved cultivars that have been introduced to horticulture over the years. In the next few slides we will look at some of the favorites. This is Silver King Wormwood. It is an ever popular but old variety developed from the prairie wormwood of the American West. One of the Artemisias used as white sage by the Native Americans for smudging. Silver King is a tough customer forming dense clumps even in poor dry soil. It can reach up to three feet in height. It will spread but it will never really get out of hand so it's not that invasive. This is another prairie wormwood, Silver Queen. It is like Silver King, but it is lower growing, only getting up to 12 to 24 inches. This is one of the all-time favorites, Silver Mound. It is incredibly soft to the touch, and it forms nice low mounds. You'll want to put this along a path, just so you can run your hands through the silky soft foliage. This is new, a golden version of Silver Mound called Ever Goldie, but we prefer to call it Gold Mound 
just because it is the perfect complement to the silver mound wormwood. Now you probably didn't know that the Artemisias can get pretty randy in the garden. When you plant a northern species such as common wormwood or Artemisia absinthium next to the to an African species Artemisia arborescens, you get a little hanky panky going and you get a completely new variety Poas castle easily one of the most popular landscaping Artemisias ever. It is hardy to zone 6, which is exactly in the middle of the hardiness of its two parents. The common wormwood is hardy to zone 3, and the Artemisia arborescens, or otherwise known as tree wormwood, is hardy to zone 8. So, like you would expect of a hybrid, hybrid variety that Poas Castle is, it's right in the middle. Sometimes there's no need to improve on a wild plant. Here's a perfect example, beech wormwood. It was found wild in the beaches of eastern North America. It looks just like the garden annual Dusty Miller. But you don't need to plant this every year because this is a hardy perennial, whereas Dusty Miller is an annual. It is also a perennial garden favorite. Turning from the East Coast and beech wormwood to the American West, I would like to turn our attention to the sage brushes that we talked about earlier. We believe the sagebrushes have a lot of potential for horticultural use. In this time of water shortages, especially in the American Southwest, where you can't even water the lawn anymore, the sagebrushes deserve a serious fresh look by breeders. We think there is a lot of room for improvement among these varieties, for developing new varieties for the garden, this sagebrush is one of the traditional sources of white sage used for smudging by the Native Americans. Even in the middle of summer, when there is almost no rain, sagebrush keeps on growing while everything else slows down and goes dormant. Here's yet another form of sagebrush from Wyoming. Close up, the sage brushes are really beautiful. You can see the flower buds in this picture. The leaves have an almost succulent look. This is also known as the common uh, desert sage that we talked about earlier. Now sage brushes can be uh, quite versatile. Normally they are low shrubs but they can become a tree as you can see on the left and they can also be kept quite small as a bonsai as you can see on the right. This is another sagebrush, silver sagebrush from the prairies of North America. It is strongly aromatic and was used by the Native Americans as a tonic. Here is black sagebrush, very common from, from uh, New Mexico all the way up to Montana. Like so many of the sagebrushes, this was used by the Native Americans for coughs and colds. Dwarf sagebrush, also known as little or low sagebrush. It grows only up to uh, 16 inches. It too is quite common all the way from Washington to California. But not, not all sagebrush, sagebrushes grow in North America. This is a beautiful Asian species that grows in the vast steppes of Russia from Siberia to the Crimea. Its scent has an 
has a hint of eucalyptus and camphor. It is used like santonica as a vermifuge to kill intestinal worms and as a digestive aid. It is almost white and it grows no higher than 20 inches. It's a beautiful plant. Here's a really cute East European uh, species from the Volvograd area of the Ukraine where it thrives in almost desert-like conditions. Beautiful low mountain variety. It grows only 8 to 12 inches high with the wonderful silver white foliage. From the mountains of Eastern Europe and the Caucasus comes this lovely alpine wormwood. Low silver white variety, beautiful for rockeries uh, and alpine gardens. Hakusan wormwood. This is a native of the Russian Far East, China, and Mongolia. It is used to treat constipation, gastritis, and colitis, and it can be used to make a lotion for healing wounds. What's really remarkable about this Artemisia is that the foliage turns a brilliant yellow and gold in autumn. Very striking in the garden. This one is the white mugwort, Artemisia lactiflora. It is interesting because it is actually quite ornamental. The leaves are, are green as the other, uh, the other uh, mugworts, but the flowers are very much white and almost ghost-like in appearance. It's an excellent dry flower, dry cut flower. And in fact, uh, the Royal Horticultural Society in 1993 recognized it as a uh, as a outstanding garden plant. They gave it the Award of Garden Merit. Normally, uh, uh, awards are given to perennial plants, uh, given to specific uh, cultivars or varieties. But this is a rare case where an entire species was recognized as ornamental. It is bitter and aromatic and it is used for menstrual and liver problems. This and the next Artemisia are really better called uh, mugworts. They're not really grown for any ornamental value, but I want to throw them in here at the end to show a bit more of the incredible diversity of the Artemisias. This one is known as Inu Yumogi. Yumogi, you will remember, is Japanese for mugwort. Inu Yumogi means dog mugwort. The young leaves and shoots can be cooked and eaten, but it is also medicinal for impotence and as an anti-inflammatory and to help stop bleeding, among other medicinal uses. This is known as Yabu Yumogi, or bush mugwort, another Asian mugwort. Just like other Yumogis, the young leaves can be cooked and eaten. In Korean medicine, it is used for stomach ache, for vomiting, diarrhea, and to stop bleeding. It's a tall perennial, native to China, Mongolia, Japan, and Korea, and also the far east of Russia. So it's a fairly widespread yomogi. Well, I hope in this, slide, this presentation I have introduced you to some favorite Artemisias, told you a few surprising things about how they grow and what they're used for and I hope that I've inspired you to try some of these. Most of these are available from Richter's in either seed or plant form so please check our catalog and we look forward to hearing from you and how they do in your garden. Thank you very much. At Richter's, it's not just a garden, it's a whole new world. 
For herb plants, seeds, veggies, and more, visit us at richters.com or call 1-800-668-4372.